Hurricane Harvey is now the worst rainfall disaster in U.S. history. What will it take for Houston and the Gulf Coast to recover practically and spiritually? The Archbishop of Galveston, Houston, and Texas Congressman Kevin Brady will join us. And she's in charge of the world's largest library right here in Washington, D.C. The Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, joins us to talk about its treasures, literacy, and the 2017 National Book Festival. And finally, actor John Corbett drops in to talk about his new film, All Saints in Theaters Nationwide, The World Over, begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Kevin Brady, Cardinal Daniel DiNardo, Carla Hayden, and John Corbett are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. I'll be live tweeting throughout. Or you can email us at worldover at EWTN.com. But I like the tweets better. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. Retired Archbishop of Los Angeles, Cardinal Roger Mahoney, is criticizing President Trump's decision to pardon former Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Mahoney called Trump's decision disgusting, saying the 85-year-old sheriff was guilty of racial profiling and, quote, harassment of our Latino brothers and the disruption of immigrant communities, end quote. The Department of Justice accused Arpaio of unconstitutional policing back in 2011, and in July of this year, he was convicted by a federal judge. President Trump has said that Arpaio was a political target of the Obama administration. Cardinal Mahoney is the first member of the U.S. Catholic hierarchy to issue a statement about the pardon. Meanwhile, a federal judge on Wednesday temporarily blocked most of Texas's tough new Sanctuary Cities law. It would have allowed police to check people's immigration status during routine interactions, such as traffic stops. The law would have fined law enforcement authorities who refused to cooperate with federal immigration officials. Police chiefs, sheriffs, and constables could even face removal from office under the law. Supporters say an immigration crackdown is necessary to enforce the rule of law. Republican Governor Greg Abbott has maintained that only lawbreakers have anything to worry about. And Defense Secretary Jim Mattis has halted the president's ban on transgendered people serving in the military for now. The former four-star general said in a statement that he would assemble a panel of experts to study the issue and offer recommendations on how to carry out Trump's directive. The panel, he said, will develop a plan that will, quote, promote military readiness, lethality, and unit cohesion. The White House said transgender individuals already serving in the military will be allowed to continue until the policy analysis is complete. The American Civil Liberties Union is now suing the Trump administration over the ban on behalf of transgender individuals in the military and those who wish to join. And in southeastern China, thousands gathered to protest the government's plan to demolish a century-old Catholic church. Clergy and lay people joined together in the rain to ask God to halt the construction, or the destruction rather, and protect their religious liberties. Some were beaten by security guards as they attempted to block demolition equipment. Months ago, the government had authorized the restoration of the historic building. However, the communist regime then decided the church should be razed to make room for a public park. The mass demonstration seems to have worked, at least temporarily. Local officials have for the time being rescinded the demolition order. We'll continue to monitor this story. And in his second major public policy statement in as many weeks, Pope Francis is urging world leaders and all to assume a respectful and responsible attitude toward creation and take appropriate measures to protect the environment. Francis made the appeal on Wednesday, announcing that he and Orthodox Patriarch Bartholomew I would be releasing a joint statement on care for God's creation. 
In 2015, Francis designated September 1st as the Church's Day of Prayer for the Environment. He went on to ask the world's wealthy and powerful to, quote, listen to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor who suffer most from ecological imbalances. And the Los Angeles City Council voted to scrap Columbus Day and replace it with Indigenous Peoples Day. The vote wasn't even close, 14 to 1. The councilman of the Wyandotte Nation pushed for the switch as some activists view Christopher Columbus as committing genocide against Native peoples. Another councilman equated the Columbus holiday with the Confederate monument controversy. Councilman Joe Busiano was the lone no vote on Wednesday. He sided with Italian Americans who view Columbus Day as a celebration of their national heritage. And Jesus, Mary, and Joseph are the latest victims of the statue-raising craze, Marin County San Domenico School. It's California's first Catholic school, has removed all but 18 of the 180 religious statues in an effort to be more inclusive. School leaders note that 80% of the students do not identify as Catholic and that the move was simply meant to make the campus more attractive to students of other faiths. Several parents have complained, saying the Dominican school is ditching a 167-year tradition. Among the statues removed, a Madonna and child that had been used for May crownings. And finally, one statue that did survive this week, and did so dramatically, was this Marian statue near Corpus Christi, Texas. An electrical fire ravaged three homes when Hurricane Harvey first came ashore. When one of the families returned, they were surprised to find their statue of Our Lady of Guadalupe unscathed and still standing amidst the rubble. Speaking to a local NBC affiliate, the family said they were thankful that they had evacuated the home before the storm. The experience reminded them of the importance of sticking together as a family, perseverance, and their faith in God. When we return, Hurricane Harvey's devastation continues to be felt on the Texas and Louisiana Gulf Coast. But with water still rising, what do the people need? Congressman Kevin Brady and Cardinal Daniel DiNardo join us from Texas when the world over continues. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over. When Harvey made landfall on the Texas Gulf Coast on August 25th, it was a Category 4 hurricane. The storm's torrential rain, high winds, and epic flooding have so far cost nearly 40 lives and forced at least 30,000 people from their homes. Texas Governor Greg Abbott has asked for $125 billion in federal aid, but many say the eventual cost may be much higher. Joining us now via satellite from North Houston is Texas Congressman, Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, Kevin Brady. Thank you so much for being with us, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Raymond. Thanks for having me. Now, your district is north of Houston, and I know your church of St. Simon and Jude, it's being used as a shelter. What are you seeing there? And tell me about this rescue effort. Well, as you know, this is a this is a, a storm with many faces. And so while our rivers and creeks have crested in our neighborhoods, uh, they haven't in others. We're still in rescue and crisis mode in southeast Texas. And even mm -hmm. now west of Houston, uh, as we see more of these problems with dams and reservoirs, we have another round of perhaps evacuations going on, which wow. is why I'm really proud of our parish, St. St. Simons and Jude. Catholic Church. They had the shelter up and running immediately. Uh, Father mm -hmm. Pat, the volunteers, uh, Maxine, the chef, all that. They had the cots up, the food there, preparations for the children. The uh, room with all the clothing and the food was overflowing when I was there. You know, really, you know, and they worked with Interfaith to help uh, other shelters get set up as well. So I tell you what, we are, we're just blessed to be 
I'm blessed to be in the parish I'm in. Well, the, this is, you know, we saw this in Katrina in New Orleans. It is these crisis moments that bring a community together, and you end up seeing the best of them, the grace of the community. And at times, it can be, in our lives it certainly was, a, a, a blessing that you didn't expect. Uh, now, I know Republicans in Congress are looking to cut almost a billion dollars from disaster account relief. Uh, to help pay for the president's border wall. Do you support that? And given the situation in Texas and Louisiana, should that plan be scrapped? Well, I don't know that that's the case, that those cuts are for the border wall. What I do know, visiting with President Trump this week in Austin when he visited, then again by phone last night, where they are all in committed to our relief, which we're still in that process, mm -hmm. search and rescue, uh, on uh, the recovery process as well and how we rebuild. And I'll tell you, uh, the federal government, our state leaders, which we're blessed with, and our community leaders and volunteers, unbelievable. So I'm very confident we'll be able to provide the help, both in the short term and in the long term. This is going to be a long, long haul. But you, you believe a relief bill is in the offing. I mean, will this situation in Texas anyway impede the tax reform plans? Yes, yeah, so I don't think it will. Um, here's why. We've done so much of the work to be prepared, and here's what we want to do. Look, we want to we want to make the code simpler and fair. We want to get rid of a lot of special interest provisions so families and our small businesses can keep more of what they earn. Mm -hmm. We also know our competitors around the world, they've just left us in our dust. That's why so many jobs are moving overseas. So we want good paying jobs coming back to America. So we, we've been running a separate parallel track for a long time. We are still focused on delivering it uh, this year, but first, we're going to take care of the immediate needs of Texas and Louisiana and the other communities that need that help. Now, some have say, said there's going to be a smaller relief bill. Do you favor that, or do you favor a big block bill like we've seen in the past, where it's, you know, $100 million or 100, you know, several hundred million dollars relief package? Billion, yeah. So I think the best approach would be a two-step approach. And we had this discussion, a number of us, from Texas and Louisiana with the White House yesterday and our House leaders, which is, look, let's take care of the immediate needs in a bill that the president submits here on emergency funding. So let's start with addressing the needs of today. And then as the waters recede and we see what those real needs longer term mm -hmm. are, let's address that then when we have more information. What I'm hopeful for is that our relief package is uh, helpful, not wasteful, and then it really addresses what our communities need, not what Washington needs. Mm -hmm. and that's been part of the problem in the past. These things get loaded up with yep. uh, Lord knows what. And so I really think if we really focus on the local needs, we'll do better. Okay. With 30 or 40,000 homes damaged in Harvey and the government flood insurance program really on the brink, what do you think should be done there? What are you recommending? Well, I'm recommending that we continue to reauthorize the flood insurance program. Mm -hmm. Look, we always uh, should look for reforms, ways to make sure that, you know, the houses that are repeatedly flooding, at some point you got to do something about that. Right. You know, you got to keep it affordable for these families that are in the coast areas, not just for Texas, but across the country as well. So, look, I think there's some good improvements we can make, but no, there's no question about it. We need to extend it, uh, make sure we give it a good, strong life. Okay, final question. I know your son has been involved in some of the rescue operations. Tell me what you've seen, what he's seen. Well, um, you know, there have been so many volunteers uh, from Texas, Louisiana, across the country yeah. helping us rescue people in life. Uh, uh, saving situations. I came back from Austin meeting with the president to learn from my wife that my 18-year-old and his friends had grabbed their boats, <laughs> uh, headed down into the fray, and throughout a day or more saved uh, almost 100 people. He didn't tell me this. My wife did. He just went about his business. And so I'm just really proud of he and his friends, along with a whole lot of other volunteers who've done so many good things and continue to. I love to see that. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for your time. Know that we are praying. Yeah for uh, the people in your district and all over Texas and Louisiana and that our hearts are with you. I'm glad to see it's not only the Cajun Navy, but the Cowboy Navy as well. This is important. It is. It is. And I'll tell you, I think Cardinal Donato, who was stranded St. Mary's Seminary, perhaps said it best the next step is 
you know, we need to wake Jesus up in the boat. Our calls for aid and mercy uh, and comfort are exactly what we need going forward. And I'm, and I'm confident that uh, there are so many prayers going out. Well, thank you, Congressman. And that's a great segue to our next guest, whose chief concern is the spiritual well-being of his people in the region. Joining us now by telephone to talk about what he's been seeing and what he and his staff are doing to ease the pain of his people is the Archbishop of Galveston, Houston, Daniel Cardinal DiNardo. I thank you so much, Your Eminence, for joining us. Uh, I, I want to give people a sense of the scope of this. You are the shepherd to 1.7 million Catholics in 10 counties, more than 8,000 square miles. Give me a sense of what you're seeing and what you've seen uh, in the last few days. Uh, well, thank you, Raymond, for uh, the interview. The uh, what, what I'm seeing, uh, some of it I must confess I've seen on TV because the flooding was so bad yeah. that you had to shelter in place in the first three days. Mm. So I was in the seminary in, on Memorial Drive in uh, Houston, mm. and I could not get to the office downtown. Wow. Literally, there was no way to get in. Uh, mm. Once uh, yesterday I got out, I, I, I've looked around. There is uh, it, The sun is out now, and if you drive in, you'll say it looks okay. And then you start looking at some of the neighborhoods, mm. and you realize... The devastation uh, that is here, uh, Raymond, is truly uh, amazing. Uh, we have in one county alone 30 to 40,000 homes that have been destroyed. Hmm. What makes this difficult is that the first wave, the rain wave, is over. The second wave, if you'll pardon the pun, the second wave is coming. That's the rivers that have overflown and right. the reservoirs and uh, the bayous. So it's a... Uh, this is uh, pretty tough. Now, uh, Houstonians are very resilient. Our Catholic community is doing very well in terms of help, reaching out. But it's, uh, this is quite a blow. Your, your eminence, and we're talking to Cardinal DiNardo, what do you say to your, your parishioners, the people in your diocese, who say, why would God allow something like this to happen? Well, one of the things I've uh, mentioned to, to our seminarians and then to others who've been talking to me, and it's partially uh, uh, humor, but to make a point, uh, it appears at times that Jesus is sleeping in the boat. Hmm. And um, we keep crying out, Lord, save us. And now the Lord arises and does calm the waters, but uh, sometimes it seems as though he's got a deaf ear or something. But mm -hmm. the Lord always accompanies us. What we're discovering here in Houston is how many neighbors have come to the help of others. And by neighbors, I mean people who just happen to be there. The list of volunteers, both in our parishes and in uh, Houston at large, is truly immense and in the best sense of the word edifying. It builds up. So I think the one way we deal with the, the question of tragedy and suffering and evil is to say, well, God sends people who bring help to us. Mm. And that's already a partial response at how God is using what is there with us to uh, help us recognize his loving care. And Card I think this has been true in Houston. Cardinal, give me a sense of uh, the impact this has had on the parishes. Do you know how many are underwater? I, I know I was, you know, I spoke at St. Ignatius uh, there not long ago, and it, it, that parish is underwater. I saw a video of it yeah, the other day. Uh, give me a sense St. of St. how many parishes are out of commission at this moment. Uh, St. Ignatius is devastated. Hmm. And, uh, the community there is really in a little bit of a trauma, including the pastor. Although, after that uh, video or whatever he put out, you know, they were saying the rosary. They are uh, uh, faithful people, but that one is in bad shape. Uh, Shrine of the True Cross Parish in Dickinson is uh, flooded. And what makes us concerned about that, there's a school there. Uh. And we've had St. Francis of Assisi, uh, a parish in North Houston, an African-American parish. There's also a school there. So uh, those are a concern to us. We have a few others. Uh, we have about 40 parishes that have some damage, a lot of them really just minor things. But oh, we have right. some with major, major damage. So this is, uh, this is really affecting us. There's no doubt about it. And what would you recommend people do who are looking in from around the country and the world, Your Eminence? What well, are you asking? Um, I mean, my, my first thought is, uh, you know, a kind of humanitarian thing. We've got so many people who are uh, suffering. Uh, I mean, I give to our Catholic charities, but we also have a... a, a a Hurricane Harvey Relief Fund right. uh, at the diocesan uh, ARCHGH.org, Harvey Relief. Right. Uh, that one can be used, and we will use that, obviously, for 
parishes as well as uh, humanitarian mm -hmm. relief. Well, I expect you all will also be part of not only the recovery of the spiritual life of the people, but getting the schools up and running. Uh, the Catholic Church tends to be better at that than even the public schools. So uh, we will be looking and following this story and know that you're in our prayers. Thank you very much, Raymond. Thank you. And uh, schools are a priority for us. There's no question. God bless you. We'll be in touch in the days ahead. Cardinal DiNardo, thanks so much for being here. And you can contribute to the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston's Hurricane Harvey Relief Fund, as well as other Catholic relief efforts at the Archdiocese's website. It's archgh.org, archgh.org. When we return, the woman who runs the world's largest library, and it's right here in Washington, D.C., the 14th librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden is up next to share some of the library's treasures and to talk about the National Book Festival. The World Over continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. It is the world's largest library. Its collections include millions of books, recordings, photographs, maps, newspapers, films, you name it. Before she was appointed last year by President Obama to run the Library of Congress, my next guest ran the Baltimore Public Library. She served as president of the American Library Association. She is the first woman and the first African-American and the first professional librarian in over 60 years to lead our national library. Here to tell us about the Library of Congress's vast collection and to preview the upcoming National Book Festival is the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Oh, so, so great nice to, to have you here. What a pleasure. Thank this you for, for coming. Now, I want to talk a little bit about you and then about this amazing collection. You have a unique vision of libraries that has so struck me as I've read about your career. You were in Chicago. You ran the libraries in Baltimore. You see them as much more than repositories of books. In fact, they're the cornerstones of democracy. They mm. really are one of the few places that everybody can feel part of and they're welcome. And we like to think of ourselves as really a refuge, but also a place that you can soar. Mm. And you expanded what Baltimore was doing. I mean, it wasn't just giving out library cards or finding books for people. You were, you turned it into really an educational center for the community. In fact, we even called it an opportunity center. Right. And it was the place that people could go and get online to apply for jobs. About 85% mm. to 95% of all jobs, any type of job, you have to file online, you know, mm. apply online. And most people, in some challenged areas don't have that access. And so we had health fairs, gave out flu shots, all of these types of things. Amazing. Tell me about, there's one little boy that I saw referenced in some of your interviews, a boy named Leonard in Chicago. Tell me about him and how he kind of characterizes exactly what you're talking about. And Leonard was part of the reason that I said, this is the profession for me. Mm. I was assigned to a storefront library on the south side of Chicago, and it was a pretty challenged neighborhood, and there was a little boy, Leonard, who was bullied and teased because he had a, a facial uh, deformity. Mm -hmm. And he would come into the library, and we struck up a friendship, and after a while, he would sit right next to my desk, and pretty soon he was... Uh, sorting cards, he was helping with preparing the crafts, and years passed and Leonard finally, he had surgery hmm. that allowed him to be hmm. more accepted, but he would, and he became a teenager, and then he would pass the storefront and wave at me. Huh. And it made me feel so good because he found that place in the library. That safe spot that to, safe to spot. grow and be affirmed. And, and then... he would read books and mm. he, could, he was so interested in so many things. Oh, amazing. Uh, I want to talk for a moment about this astounding collection that even I didn't realize until I moved to Washington what the Library of Congress contains. You incidentally have 3,200 staffers who, who you, you oversee, and 160 million items, including things like uh, the, the, the George Gershwin's piano, our friend Jerry Lewis's film collection. 
home movies. Home movies. Why do we need all that? Uh, well, it's the collective cultural memory and historical memory of the United States and the world. Mm. And it, it really is a resource for anyone that has curiosity, that wants to find out more. And we also are sustaining creativity and saying this is a celebration. You recently digitized something near and dear to my heart. 20 years ago, I know I'm confessing, I, I was going to write a play about Alexander Hamilton a oh, little darn. late now, but I took <laughs> notes 20 years ago. They put me in one of your special yes. collections room with the gloves and I flipped through Hamilton's letters and read many of them for days. You now have digitized all of these yes. letters. T tell us about and that. And that's effort. the wonder of it. When you think about, for instance, the papers of 23 presidents from George mm. Washington to Coolidge, the diary of Teddy Roosevelt, where he marked on mm. February 14th, that day that his mother and his wife died, and he said, my life is over. Mm. And then you have Hamilton's letter, this last mm. letter to his wife before yeah. the interview, as they called it, mm, yeah. and that people can of course, visit and look at these things just like you did, but with digitization, anyone, that little boy, yeah. south side of Chicago, can sit at a computer and look at Hamilton's letters mm. and the letters of his wife. It's amazing. Are you worried that the dis digitization will um, force people or, or encourage them not to make the experience of going to a library and reading a hard book or a hard manuscript. Well, and I'm smiling because digitizing whets the appetite, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> okay, so once you see it and then you want to see the real thing. Uh -huh. And that's another part of it. And you want to read more about it. And it just gets you going. So that's what we're trying to do. Tell me about the, the origins. I was fascinated by this. The origins of the contents of Abraham Lincoln's pockets when he was assassinated. Give me this backstory of how this came to In me. In 1975, the Librarian of Congress was new and was exploring the office of the librarian. And there was a door that seemed like it didn't go anywhere. And so he opened it and behind the door was a safe, like a bank safe. Huh. However, there was no one that could open it. and. Uh, the legend goes that a, a gentleman was uh, released from a facility who had special skills <laughs> and opened the safe and there was only one thing in the safe and that was a small box and he opened it and it said these are the contents of Abraham Lincoln's pockets the night he was assassinated and oh. it was given to the library by Abraham Lincoln's granddaughter. Oh my gosh. And he had two pairs of spectacles. He had articles about himself that some were good, some weren't. Mm. He had um, a handkerchief that had his initials. He had a $5 a Confederate bill. Mm. And then something that really touches you in a way because he had a button that had come off of his pocket. Yeah. And just think about the humanness of that. If uh -huh. something, if this comes up, you hey, put it. You pick it that, up. Mm, beautiful. It yeah. tells us a lot. It humanizes him. It, it brings humanizes him, really. him. He was a real person in so many ways, and he's relatable. Do you feel yourself as library of Cong librarian of Congress, do you feel that you are the custodian of Americans' literacy or America's literacy? Is that an, a burden you feel? Oh, no. We're partners with mm. so many other types of organizations and institutions, and so working together, we can really work on, I think, something that people might not realize, that illiteracy is uh, unfortunately a contributor to a lot of the challenges that people have worldwide. Right. When you think about 65 percent of adults worldwide are functionally illiterate, mm. and how that contributes to some of the issues that they face in life. Oh, no, this has become a passion of mine, writing for children. You see the vast weight and the, the, 
the bitter patrimony you pass along to them yes. if they can't read or if a parent can't read. So I love that you've committed so much of your work and the Library of Congress to fostering reading. And we're going to talk in a moment about the National Book Festival, which is such an amazing event. But I want to talk about you for a moment oh. because you and I share a love of mysteries. We love mysteries. What is it that draws you to mysteries? Well, a mystery is a puzzle. Yeah. And it you want to see, well, who done it, as they say. They yeah. call them who done it. Yeah. And it's usually the best mysteries are the ones where Nobody really gets hurt. <laughs> yeah, you like those English cozies. I like the English See, I like the cozy, ones, but okay. <laughs> English cozy, the Cotswolds, the, the tea, you know, the, the arsenic, and the but Jane nothing, Marbles. all of that. And what, but it's very satisfying because at the end, something gets solved. Hmm. And I think that's a, another part of it, the yeah. attraction of mysteries. Yeah, me too. I love, the, I love the justice is always restored at the yes. end of a good mystery, even yes. if the world is out of sync and crazy. Tell me about the National Book Festival and Ooh. how you're continuing it this year. I was thrilled to be a part of it last year, and it was just, what an experience. Over I mean. 200,000 people hmm. one day, over 100 and something authors, hmm. and authors for children, all types of authors mm -hmm. and you just had this festival of enjoying reading and books and buying books and programming it's just exciting so this is the 17th year wow. and it started actually um, when First Lady Laura Bush herself a librarian a librarian um, had started the Texas Book Festival and when she became First Lady of the Nation mm. she said this is what we need in promoting literacy and it's continued ever since and now it includes literacy awards for organizations worldwide. Um. One of our um, benefactors, uh, David Rubenstein, mm -hmm. has supported that. So there are actual awards giving out, mm -hmm. given out, there's a poetry slam for young people <laughs> and then headliners like uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice is coming. Wow. I mentioned David McCullough. Oh, yeah. Mr. Baldacci. Oh, uh, yeah. Talk all, about that. All the uh, thriller JD fans Mans, will The be thriller there. fans, Michael Lewis. So there's oh, an wow. all-star lineup. There's a main stage, and it's going to be live streamed. So if you're not able to be in Washington, D.C., you can see it. in the convention center. You can see it, mm. and that's a, a really added plus. I agree. No, it's it's a it's a magnificent festival and a lot of fun, and it allows you to. There's something about meeting an author and having yes. them discuss their work that just enriches the experience, and particularly for kids, for for families. I think it's an incredible resource. And the question and answer periods, yeah. and then to be able to actually purchase the book and get the author to sign it. And yeah. that's where there's more interaction too. Yeah, when no, you really get fun. to do it. So it's, you, it's just a full day. And when I think about how many people are just walking around having fun, going, oh my, and they're checking their schedules and they're looking and trying to rush here and rush there. It's, now, it's really something. I love that you also have continued something that brings Americans together yes. at a time when we so need that unity. And literacy, books, the stories that sustain us as a people are so critical. Stories. And when you see an audience just enraptured by an author mm -hmm. telling a story, and then you see the young people as well. Yeah. And we have graphic novelists, people, all types of literacy. No, you have people sketching. sketching they do sketches for the kids. Things. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it really is. So a, I, I would event. encourage everyone to tune in or to come in. You bet, and I'll <laughs> give you the coordinates on all that in just a moment. Before I let you go, Madam Librarian, Storiented, which is what this segment is, it's, it's a literacy initiative I founded, but the idea is stories orient us in the world. They show us our place in the world. What was the story that set you on your path and the lesson you gleaned from it? What, when you talk just now about your place in the world. Mm -hmm. The book, and I love to read, and I was going to this storefront library of my own across yeah. from the school. I was about eight, and some person put a book in my hand, Bright April, mm. and it was about a little girl who was brown like me. She was in the brownie troop. She had two pigtails, and for the first time, I saw myself reflected in a book. Mm. And that taught me that children 
need to have books as windows on the world, yeah. but also they need to see themselves in something that we say is so important, books and literacy. Right. And then it's like, there I am, and there's my family. Hmm. And since I've been talking about it so much lately in terms of influences in my life, I've received letters from women from varied backgrounds. The first one came from a woman in Minnesota who said I was a skinny uh, girl, handicapped, and Bright April was my favorite book mm. because she was an outsider. And then recently a woman in Connecticut who shared it with her two daughters and found a copy, a mm. battered copy, she said, and she just read it to her granddaughters who identified with this little girl. And so that just, that lesson that young people need to get something from a story too, not just entertainment, yeah. but Yeah, and the importance overall. of diversity in yes. books, particularly children's books, because it is important for kids to see themselves and place themselves in that drama. Right, and that's what the, the pull is. You can imagine yourself taking great adventures mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. types of books, but it's also good to see something that relates to you too, because that's what yeah. reading can do. Uh, tell, give me your strategies. You've spent your life as a librarian and you interact daily with young readers. What would you advise parents who have reluctant readers at home? What are they missing? What should they be doing? What they might want to do is think about making reading fun mm -hmm. and not being too prescriptive. If they want to read a comic book, fine. Let them read it because they're reading and it's the practice of reading and readers uh, become better when they practice and they can read a cereal box they can read that and also to model reading in the home i had that advantage uh, with a grandmother that read to me and would read next to me my mom and so show them and and you don't have to read war and peace you can mm -hmm. be reading a magazine and it's reading time and everybody gets to read what they want. And mm -hmm. if they see an adult doing something, you know, they will model. They, they follow it. Yeah, no, right. that's great advice. Great advice. Final question. You were appointed by President Obama for this position. I am a little distressed <laughs> that he dropped the lifetime appointment and turned this <laughs> into a 10-year appointment. Your thoughts on that? Was that a good idea or maybe not such a good idea since you're just well, getting started? Well, actually, Congress decided, and it was, I think, a good decision because libraries are evolving and mm. changing, mm. and you might need to make sure that you were changing as well in terms of the leadership. So I think it's okay, and okay. especially at my age. Oh, come on, <laughs> your age. And your mother is still with us and lives in your building, you were telling yes. me. Yes. I mean, it must be amazing having your mother there, watching you and breaking down the barriers you've broken down and being the example you are. I mean, you're, you're, you're like Bright April to well, a lot of she, girls looking in. I have to tell you, though, my mom was the example because she was um, in social work in Chicago. And some of my earliest memories were sitting, doing my homework in the back of a community meeting mm -hmm. that she was heading up in housing departments, the social services mm -hmm. that she was responsible for, battered women's uh, mm -hmm. shelters, working with youth and gangs and all of that. So I grew up with this service, service and using the thing that I'm involved in to serve has been a watchword. Wow, and to have your mother there along for the Oh journey. my goodness, she's what a, a stay-at-home mom, she says now though. <laughs> I love that. She had to work when I was coming up. Carla Hayden, thank you so much for this. <laughs> thank and you. For, and for the great work you're doing. I hope we can come visit. I want to see the, take the people in the cameras. That would a be wonderful. Of some of your collections. We'll bring out the good silver. All right, it, go, <laughs> oh y'all, it, it won't be hard to find it. The 17th Library of Congress National Book Festival takes place this Saturday, September 2nd, at the Washington Convention Center here in DC. It is free. It's a wonderful event for families, literary types, readers. Go. The information and schedule and authors is on the Library of Congress website. That's loc.gov. Thanks so much again for being here. When we return, actor John Corbett is here to talk about his new film. It's, um, it's a story of faith and redemption called All Saints. When the world over continues, stay right there.
Well, I'm Michael. You're here to sell the church, ain't you? Strip it, sell the land. I'm here to be your pastor. What's your name? Ah, it don't matter. We ain't gonna know each other long enough. Well, we don't really know that. We do know that 30 acres of prime bottom land will buy a whole lot of pointy bishop hats. That's probably true, but the fact is there's just too many empty pews in there. Well, that ain't a pastor talking. That's an errand boy. Errand boy? No, I'm not really an errand boy, but you had 12 people in that church today. Jesus had 12 people. He done all right, didn't he? Welcome back to the world over. That was my next guest, starring in the new movie, All Saints. You'll recognize him from films like My Big Fat Greek Wedding and the classic TV series Northern Exposure. He's now getting some of the best reviews of his career for his work in All Saints. It's a faith-based film in which he plays an Episcopalian pastor named Michael Spurlock, who's charged with trying to save a failing Tennessee church. It's based on a true story. And I spoke to him recently about the movie and why he chose it. Here's my exclusive interview with John Corbett. So, John, I want to start talking about the film, All Saints. Why this character? You play Michael Spurlock, who's a salesman who becomes a pastor of all things. What drew you to this role? It seems outside of the type of thing you've done before. I, I love the story. My, my CPA of 25 years said, hey, I've got this guy I've been working with for 20 years named Steve Gomer. He wrote a script. He wants you to, to read it. And I said, Gary, please, every guy I know, the, the guy that puts the carts together at the, shopping, at the shopping grocery store has got a script. He said, I've never asked you for anything, John. And so I said, OK, <laughs> send it to me. And you know, I was 10 pages into this thing. And I, I called Gary back, and I said, what's Steve's number? And I called him up, and I said, this is great. I finished the script, and I said, this is great. I, uh, I want to help you. How can I help you? He said, if I have you, I can go get the money. And I said, well, let's see what we can do. And, you know, four months later, we were shooting. It's, a, it's called All Saints, about a church that's called All Saints outside of Nashville, Tennessee, in Smyrna. That my guy, Michael Spurlock, who was a salesman with a wife and, and a 12-year-old boy, decides he's going to be of service, and he becomes an Episcopalian minister. And that's where our movies picks up. The day he's ordained, his first assignment is to shutter this uh, church that only has 12 people left in the congregation because they've all gone to the mega church two miles down the road. Mm. And these Burmese refugees that have been in a camp in, Th in Thailand who don't speak English uh, get relocated from Thailand to Smyrna, Tennessee, and, the, and they're Christians, and they show up at his door, and he doesn't turn them away. And he says, okay. And everybody, the bishop's council, his wife says, what are you doing? Your job is to close this church up and sell off the property. And he says, I, I have to do what I feel like I came here to do. And that's where our movie starts. Yeah, he has a different plan. We won't ruin it by telling people what happens, but it's a, it's a great story and a feel-good story, too. Tell me, was there any trepidation on your part about accepting a role like this? I mean, this is the first time you've led a picture uh, in a role that the, the, the guy's on every page of the script and almost every moment of the movie. 30 years in the business, I've played a lot of supporting roles. This is the first time in a feature film I've played the lead. And uh, the, there's a lot at stake. When you're in everyone else's movie as a supporting character, you want the movie to do well. And, you, you know, your ego is happy when it <laughs> scores at the box office. But there's nothing like having your your presence and your name on this thing. And, you know, if it flops, I mm -hmm. feel uh, personally responsible on lots of levels and in a way that I don't when I'm supporting. And, uh, yeah, it's different. It's a, diff it's a different thing. You know, I've played these nice guy roles pretty much my whole career in movies mm -hmm. like Big Fat Greek Wedding or Raising Helen and... Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I didn't want to, I wasn't looking to play another nice guy role. In fact, this, this fellow is a priest in a sort of, we could call it a G-rated Disney movie, but it reminds me of one of my favorite movies uh, called Tender Mercies with Robert Duvall. Oh, sure. You know, no, no action in this movie. We don't have any car chases. We don't rob a bank. There's no special effects monsters, but 
the story's there. And if you have it, you know, there's an old saying in this business, if it's on the page and you can get it on the screen, you know, maybe you have something. And I, th mm -hmm. I think we put, we put the tale together. Yeah, no, that's a, well, invoking Robert Duvall here is like, you know, invoking one of the apostles. We love him here, and he's been on the show. Uh, tell me, how did being an altar boy, or did it oh, that's cool. prepare you in any way to play a passer in this way? Because you were an altar boy. I was. Well, I went to, I went to two schools. First through eighth grade with 13 kids, Catholic school, mm -hmm. called St. Joseph's Cathedral, where I, where I started out to, uh, as an altar boy, I think, in the fourth or fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And then on the same block was Central Catholic High School. This is in Wheeling, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And I went to school with about 90 kids for those four years, graduated in 79, mm -hmm. had the last eclipse. And... Um, <laughs> Just, you know, it's, it's like a show, man. I mean, being a priest is like a show. And the altar boys, you know, we get there early. We make sure all the vestments are ready to go. We get the Eucharist ready. I shine up the bells and getting the wine ready and then hanging out with, with our priest, Father Brown. You know, I, I didn't have a dad growing up. Uh, and I'm an only child to a mom who was only 20 years older than me, and I lived a block away from the school and the church. So Father Brown, who seemed like an old man at the time when I was 13 or 14 years old, who was probably only 24, he took me in and my friend Jay Wood, who also uh, didn't have a father, and we would ride around wheeling in his Grand Prix, listening to eight tracks of bread and the Eagles. He really stepped in there to be a father figure. He was just a dude, a bro on so many levels. You know, let, he'd have the key and let us go in and shoot basketballs in, in the little gym on Friday nights. Um, so it was just a different perspective. And, and so the, in what way did, all, did that experience and that sense of a priest in his public face and privately, I mean, as a young person, you got to see both sides of that person, that priest. Did that in any way inform this portrayal in the movie, in All Saints? Not in any way, in all ways. So if I didn't have that experience and I didn't spend, I did not spend a lot of time with Michael Spurlock, who, who is now involved in St. Thomas Church here in Manhattan. Right. Uh, I, uh, and of course you can't I, I tried to make not, not Michael, without having spent time and knowing so. him, just a man, as, as much of a regular guy as I could. And, um, you know, it was from that, I, I think I would have put too much reverence into it if I hadn't had all that background growing up. Because, you know, once you get the vestments on, and these are some heavy vestments. There's, you know, you got your black and white priest collar, the black pants. There's a white thing that goes over it, uh, <laughs> different than an altar boy, which is usually just the, the black and the white. Right, and the by the time they get the big green thing on, oh, man, I don't know how you swing that for an hour because <laughs> it's, it, I was soaked. I was soaked 10 minutes under this thing. That, we need to find a new factory that makes this stuff because that material doesn't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got to get it. they got to make it out of linen I, or I, something, I, man. Cause a lighter, a lighter it's fabric. Like a, it's like a boat cover is what they make it out of. <laughs> yeah, they make you, it out of a boat cover. You canvas. wrote a recent piece. I want to share this with the audience. You wrote a piece and you said, I've learned like the priest at play in All Saints that when God sends a suggestion our way, the best thing we can do for ourselves is say yes. You, when I read your biography and how this career came to be, it seems there was a series of yeses and things you didn't plan in your life that kind of fell upon you and led you to your ultimate end, your ultimate destination, and what you were really being called to. Tell me a little bit of that story. I know you, you're in Wheeling. You end up going then crossing the country. You go to, uh, you're working in a pipe factory, and you had a mishap, a pretty big one. Right. I, uh, my mom and dad split up when I was two. We lived in California. We went back to West Virginia. He stayed in California, so I didn't know him <laughs> at all. And I saw him maybe three times in uh, the years from two to I graduated high school. He came to my high school graduation. He drove cross country. His name was also John Corbett. <laughs> and he said, I know you're not going to college. If you ever want to work in the steel industry, come out and see me. He was a welder in a, in the, for the Boilermakers Union. I show up at his door, 
hey, I'm taking you up on the offer. And he was so generous. I didn't know his wife that he had been with since 1969, and this was in 80. And they let me live with them for almost a year and never once made me feel uncomfortable. In 1985, a bunch of pipes came off an assembly line and hit me in the back. And I was, uh, I had a lot of d damage back there. Couldn't do manual labor anymore. So dad said, go to, go to our community college. That's where he had learned to weld. So I went there and I was lost in two weeks. One day in the cafeteria, I met these actors. I was all by myself, one of those long tables. And these kids, about four or five of them came, sat 15 feet away and I could hear them making jokes. And I inserted a couple jokes and they slid down to me and we started talking. I was older, I was 25 and they were 18. And then they were leaving and I had two hours before my next class and I was gonna quit because I was mm. just lost. They said, you wanna come with us to our acting class? And you did. I can just come, let's go. So I went with them and I walked in this theater and everything was black. Black painted walls, black big boxes to sit on. Uh, it was air conditioning because it was hot and outside and I just felt you know, embraced in this thing. It was an improv class. They did improvs and at the end, the teacher, Georgia Wells, said, do you want to do one? I got up, I did an improv, uh, I made the kids laugh and I quit all those other classes and signed up for acting and within two months I was in hair. I was, I was not wobbling around, I was taking a lot of painkillers because of my back, all that stuff left and it changed my life. A chicken burger changed my life because <laughs> I was hungry and that's why I went in the cafeteria that day. That is amazing. Uh, tell me what's next, John. And first of all, before I let you go, what do you want people to take away from this movie? What do you hope they gain from seeing All Saints? I know there's a lot of talk. It's 2017. Uh, we have a new president. We have a lot of feelings about whether or not we should let refugees come into our country. That's not what this movie's about. It's not a message movie, mm -hmm. but this movie's about helping others and being part of a community and loving thy neighbor. And mm. it's, it's uh, what I think the movie's about and it's yeah. a good reminder. And if you see old Fred over there needs a hand, go help Fred. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm getting out of this movie. Dear friends in Christ, the Reverend Michael Spurlock. We didn't meet before, I'm Michael. You're here to sell the church, ain't you? The fact is, we had 12 people in that church today. Jesus had 12 people. He done all right. Michael, you're not here to perform CPR. If passing out a few flyers helps my congregation feel they can let the church go, I'm gonna do it. We have 15 new family not made up food for their children. Well, here's the thing, Yay Win. We're closing the church, we're broke. Well, what is broke? What do you think will happen to them when we leave? Let's keep them in our prayers and ask for God's help. Aren't you God's help? I think God spoke to me. What did he say? He said, I've given you land, I've given you farmers. Do the math. He said, do the math. He wants us to save this little church by making the land into a farm. That voice you hear, be sure it's God's voice, not your own. And people are not here to pick your beans, they're here to be Americans. What's more American than farming? Start a farm, we work together and save the church. Amen. Yeah, how you gonna plow? It's funny you should mention that. You're blowing your boss's chance at a big sale here, preacher. You risked our careers on this. <laughs> you swore an oath as a minister to God, not to me, to obey even when you disagree. You swore an oath as a Christian to care for the least of these. This whole thing, it's not some ego trip I'm on, is it? I thought I knew the will of God. Is it his voice I heard or was it mine? We're back where we started. I want to show you something. We are not where we started. We're somewhere completely new. All Saints starring John Corbett is now playing in theaters everywhere. That is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to join us next week. Catholic League President Bill Donahue will be here in studio. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen 
On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.